So we are here for Motivate Therapies Facebook Live Self-Care Solutions. My name is Denise Nichols. I am an occupational therapist and owner of Motivate Therapy, where we have pelvic floor therapists, so occupational therapists and physical therapists that specialize in pelvic floor therapy. And our whole premise is that you cannot change anything that you're not aware of and education and motivation, therefore, are the key to creating positive life lo lifelong lasting change. So last week we talked about anxiety in your pelvic floor. And a week before that I did some live prolapse um, care and prevention classes. And I realized that because I talk about this all the time, I often forget that people don't even know what a pelvic floor is. And um, it's really important for us to understand our own bodies. So I am the author of Your Self-Care Matrix. And in that book, I talk about self-care truly changing your life on a daily basis kind of self-care is based on education and understanding what your body is telling you on a constant basis. So, for example, if I'm sitting here and I start to have some back pain, if I ignore it, which you know we all do, um, the longer I ignore it, the more my body's gonna learn to keep adjusting. And over time, that's gonna create um, postural compensation. I'm gonna, um, it's going to, it could create, create pain, it could create inflammation, um, it's going repetitively over time, create different movement patterns that can perpetually just keep creating more problems. So, and pain and urgency and leakage and constipation and all of those things, believe it or not, can go hand in hand. So, in the book, Your Self-Care Matrix, I talk about the importance of learning to hear, so hearing your body signals. So we all know that hearing and listening are um, two different things, right? You can hear your child saying, I need to go to the bathroom, but you might be not listening so much because you're focused on something else. And then by the time you do listen, oh, now we've had an accident possibly. So hearing and listening are two different things. So you can hear the fact that you have to go to the bathroom, but you're gonna, you might not listen, right? Because you're busy doing something. And in the pelvic floor therapy world, <laughs> I often find that it's us caregivers that um, can end up having problems down the line. Healthcare workers and teachers are the two top professions I would say that we see a lot of. Um, hairdressers, people who prolong, prolong stand and people who don't have time to listen to their bodies. So their habits get a little, can get, can get out of whack. Um, it could be all well and good until we go and retire. So the difference between hearing and listening is understanding what it is your body's telling you. So you might hear pain, but it doesn't help you understand the cause. So the, the difference, what the self-care matrix is really about is listening means you have to know, understand your body and the functions of your body. So that's why I wanted to talk about what is a pelvic floor, help you understand how it is your core. We're truly talking about your core here. So this is what we're talking about, right? So this is your pelvis and I'm gonna go ahead and take the floor out. So this is what you're sitting on right now or possibly if you're standing. These are your legs. So we're talking about your pubic bone. And then these are what we think of as our hip bones, right? If you put your hands on your hips. These are what you're sitting on, typically, your butt bones, your sits bones. And then if we look in the back, this is your sacrum. This is L, L so we have L4, L5, L5, S1 in this area. So this is the L5, the sciatic nerve, comes out through here and then all the nerves that branch off of the sciatic 
has to go through here. So your tailbone is connected to your floor, so that's why it's off right now. So tailbone, butt bones, hip bones. This is looking at you from behind, and then this is looking at you from the front. Pubic bone, this separates um, during pregnancy and delivery. So you can see we're not talking about one solid bone. We've got these two bones called the ilium, and then we have the sacrum, okay? And so you should be able to, these should be able to separate and move when we walk, right? If we were one solid bone, we wouldn't be able to move. Um, well, we'd be moving kind of like a robot, right? So that's the point of joints. So obviously if we were just bone, um, we would be pretty rickety. Muscles are what makes make us flexible and pliable and be able to move in a million different directions and do all kinds of cool things. So any of the muscles that connect to these bones, right, are going to, are, are a part of your core. They are ultimately what stabilizes your everything, right? So your hips are here. So your hips, your back, your abdomen, your trunk. So this is truly the bottom of your core. The top of your core being your head, your neck, your chest. So your shoulders and shoulder blades are connected to your upper core is what we'll call it. And then your hips, low back, and abdomen connected to your lower core and therefore affected by it. Let's talk about your pelvic floor. Okay, so it's about two palms full. This is your floor. So it sits right inside. So this is connected to your pubic bone and then this is connected to your tailbone. So we talk about a hammock or a sling. That's really what we're talking about here. And this is the deepest part of your pelvic floor. We're actually talking about three layers of muscles. And this is your deepest layer what you might have heard of as your levator ani. So these are the muscles that have to really stretch um, on delivery. Um, and so I'm gonna place it inside just so you can see. Tailbone fits right in here. <laughs> so so we're looking at here. Let me turn it this way. There we go. So we're looking at you from the side. Here's your pubic bone, hip bone, and your hip. If we lay you on your on your back, like in a typical position um, for women anyway, call a lobotomy position. So if you're going to get a pap test or give birth, you're laying on your back. So here you can see. This is called the um, puborectalis. It wraps around the rectum. And then just to the side is what's called the iliococcygeus. And I'm gonna turn it so you can see that the iliococcygeus connects to your coccyx. And then if I, we look a little bit deeper, so here's your pelvic floor, here's, that's the hammock. And then this muscle that's connected right to this big ligament is your obturator internus. So many of us know of the piriformis, which is, we think of that as our sciatica uh, muscle. The obturator and the piriformis are your hip rotators. So just like I was saying, we have ro rotator cuffs in the shoulder. We also have rotators in the hips and they are directly connected to your pelvic floor. So that is why hip issues total hips even, if you've ever had um, blood, weird bowel or bladder things after, or difficulty with uh, sex after a total hip replacement or a labral tear, that can certainly affect your pelvic floor. And often when, we, when we're looking at the pelvic floor, that's why we assess your hips. It's really important to understand how the range of motion, flexibility and strength of your hips. If um, there's issues there, then we wanna rule out um, any pathological thing going on with your hip, like a labral tear or an impingement, something like that. Because like I said, the nerves, the sciatic nerve that comes out through here 
then has to go through these ligaments. Basically dive in and out through the piriformis and the apturator, and then they come comes right out through here. All right, so we have our pelvic floor and our pelvis. So let's step away from the anatomy for a second. So essentially we're talking about a, a container, right? So your pelvis, pelvis is pelvic, your pelvis, your pelvic bones are a container. Okay, so here's your container. And obviously it's not round, but what sits in the container? Your bladder and then your prostate is connected to that or the uterus is also physically connected to that. And then you have your rectum and then everything that sits on top, right? So the intestines all sit on top. And so then they sit in a web of fascia. So think of like a spider web. And so when you move, right? So if I stand up and then I sit back down and then I start running and then I jump, right? These organs in here have to move around. Um, and what, so the strength of this container, the floor, the abdomen, and then what's all above it, so your diaphragm, your chest, and then on the sides, your hips and back, right? They're all responsible for making sure that these guys stay in place and then don't fall out, right, or affect. So it's all about pressure. We're talking about a pressure system. So how well can your floor handle pressure from above? Um, and generally it does a really great job, even after multiple deliveries, which is you know quite amazing. The, the human body is quite amazing. So that's why, imagine, right, if we um, have some episiotomies, which is uh, the cutting, right? So we cut here to allow for the opening um, of baby's head. So if we have some cuts here, or we have a C-section above, right? So we could have a cut here, we could have cuts down below. You could imagine over time, if I start poking holes and making the, the, this floor, right? Less strong, more vulnerable, then, then it might not handle the pressure down as well. So your floor is complicated in the fact that it has so many different jobs. So. I will include a link to our um, website and on that we have self-care solutions under education and the self-care solutions are exercises and all kinds of great self-care things that you can do for yourself um, for, for the health of your hips and your core um, meditations and education on the learning center one, um, again, under, so you go under education and then self-care solutions, and then there's the learning center. And in the learning center, there is um, what to expect for pelvic floor therapy for men and for women. And then there is a, what is a pelvic floor uh, presentation. And um, so you'll see more pictures that, that, um, that might help you understand a little bit more if um, this is confusing. It is a lot of information, but um, it is, very much something that I've seen change people's lives once they understand how their movements and their habits and their behaviors affect their floor and therefore their core. So what is a pelvic floor? You'll find more and I go into more specifics about the five functions of your pelvic floor. But we'll start with, um, I think one of the things that, that truly um, affect us over time, right? So I talk about ages and stages. So hormones um, and then the, all the repetitive habits that we have obviously may not affect us in, at year one, but it, by the time we're 40 and have had, now we're having hormone changes and now we're having, um, we've had surgeries and things like that. Posture, pelvic stabilization, right? So stabilizing the movement of the organs and everything in here. There's um, research that shows the position of your pelvis. So women tend to be what we call anteriorly tilted, right? So tend to be more archy in our low back. And you can see how, what that's gonna do to the contents of the organs. 
This position being more archy in the back, right? So we're sitting longer. So we have a tendency to, to sit more forward on our pu pubic bones. Um, that turns the pelvic floor muscle activity down. So you can imagine over time, if all of my organs are, are forward, sitting forward in my pelvis, and I've had some surgeries and I'm weaker, maybe in certain areas, um, that over time that could create prolapse, right? That my floor might not be able to handle that constant pressure. The opposite would be schlumping, which a lot of us do too. And I see this more as an issue for men. Um, so tuck and tail, that position, as you can see how all the balls move back now, that can actually increase pelvic floor muscle tension and activity. So if a muscle that's more active can, get, can be more fatigable and have less oomph when you need it. Um, especially first thing in the morning when your bowels are full and your bladder is full or end of the day even. So stabilizing your pelvis. Um, so that's super important. And, and that's what we think of as far as um, core, I think, posture and alignment. Um, but the other thing, as you can see, is supporting the organs, right? So these balls moving around, supporting those. And so now the balls, the, your organs, have all kinds of cool ligaments that connect and help suspend things. And then the floor below helps support from the bottom. So supporting organs, stabilizing pe your, pel your pelvis, stabilizing your posture is one function. The other one is to support your organs. So as you can see, the only thing that's stopping anything from falling out is this. So if you can think about someone who is chronically constipated, so we talk about shy poopers, right? So if your whole life you have ignored that first urge that I have to go, I have to go, because you're at school and you didn't wanna poop at school. Like I said, your pelvic floor is going to tension in response to pressure from above. So it's not time to peer poop, tight, 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 right? Keep it shut, keep the tension around the rectum. <laughs> It's nice being able to pull these out, but sometimes it's harder to keep it in. There you go. So it's gonna keep the, the chute shut. The floor is supposed to keep it at an angle, right? So, so you're not going. But now you haven't gone. And now it can be really hard for you to relax well enough to move things out and down. So you can imagine five, 10, 25 years later of your brain going, oh no, ignore that urge, don't go yet. Keep it tight, keep it tight. And then now you're saying, oh no, I have to go, I have to go, and, and it's hard for you. You might start to go because of all that pressure, the floor can relax, you start to poop, but or pee, um, and then in mid-pee or poop, your floor can go, oh, I gotta return back. So now you're not fully emptying. And then that can create problems as well, right? So. One of the things that really can affect our quality of life is that urgency, right? If you have an urgency of bladder or bowel, right? I have to go, I have to go. It can really affect, I think, your confidence as far as leaving the house, as far as getting anything done, sitting through a movie. We want you, for the bowel, we want you to listen to that first urge because that should be the easiest time to go. Ignoring that signal, can create a pelvic, a tight pelvic floor. So PFMD, pelvic floor muscle dysfunction. Pelvic floor muscle dysfunction, most of us think as just an old lady problem that it's weakness and I need to Kegel. And for you men out there, Kegel is the term that we use for the pelvic floor muscle contraction. So if you can squeeze off the flow of urine or um, stop poop. So, that is a question that pelvic floor therapists will ask. Can you stop the flow of urine? And it's funny, a lot of people are like, I don't know, I've never tried, I've never even thought about it. So you can't change anything you're not aware of and education is the key to that. So good job for listening to this and even better job to just listen to what your body's saying. Bladder urgency is a little bit different um, because 
like I said, urgency affecting quality of life. It can create fear. So if every time you have to pee, you, um, or let's say you've peed or you, you've held it and then maybe you start, you leak a little bit. So now your body's learning that the, the signal of urgency to pee mean you might leak. So now you start running to the bathroom. And if you are going to the bathroom anywhere in between, you know, every 30 minutes to an hour, that is completely affecting your quality of life and is not normal. A normal bladder should be able to hold 16 ounces or about a cup and a half to two cups of urine. But when we pee, we don't always, we always have something in there. So we, we don't always complete, or we don't always empty. So um, there is a, a test called the post void residual to show you can do an ultrasound of your bladder before and after you pee. And most people have about a half a cup of urine still in there. So you can still feel women who are in men, I, I think, who have fear of leakage and urgency, they might feel like they still have to go or haven't gone. They might feel the urge to pee at like two ounces. So you, we can have a heightened sense of awareness when we have habitually learned that urge means I'm gonna leak. And what that does is create tension in this muscle. Right, so now the muscle's going, oh, oh, pressure from above, from the bladder, oh, I have to go. Um, tight, 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 keep it tight. And what we'll tend to do is suck it in, hold our breath, and we'll have more pressure from above. So if I'm, I have fear of leakage, I start to suck in my abdomen, hold my breath, chest breathe, <laughs> right? That can suck everything up. And then now we're putting pressure down because I'm, think about if I'm squeezing the middle of a can of Coke, Right, where is that pressure gonna go? And especially in someone who's had surgery, whether it's prostate surgery or episiotomies from um, babies, that pressure down um, might be more than the floor can handle, whether it's weak from um, getting thin from hormones and aging and things like that and, and babies, um, or just from being tight all day long because you're constipated or pain. Pain can create the same thing. So when we talk about stabilizing the pelvis and supporting the organs, the floor needs to be at its normal resting level. So I'll continue to talk more about biofeedback, but bi what biofeedback has shown us is that you sitting there right now, not peeing or pooping your pants, right? We hope. <laughs> not see your pelvic floor therapist. Because the brain is telling these muscles to be active, so about 2.0 microvolts of activity, it's staying somewhat active. It's keeping um, the urine and stool in, okay? Then when you go to cough, <coughs> we'll see that it has to increase to about maybe five or seven. <coughs> and then it has to come back down. So I liken it to my, my bicep here. So I'm about 2.0 microvolts of activity. <coughs> I cough, it tensions off, um, the urethra will say, right, so you don't pee your pants, and then it has to return back so that the next cough <coughs> is effective. Next cough <coughs> is effective. And often what we see people complain about, right, leaking is usually the third or fourth cough. So if I cough <coughs> and then I don't relax well, <coughs> and then I don't relax well, <coughs> right, now we're not talking about a really strong effective Kegel anymore, right? So it's way more about coordinating, learning how to relax and contract, and relax and contract. And what's going on up above in your chest, in your abdomen, especially that diaphragm, if what's going on up here is not allowing this resting level to be optimal throughout the day, it can create problems whether it's sphinctering off stool urine, um, if it doesn't do that well, then you're gonna leak, right? So it's called urinary incontinence or fecal incontinence. Or if it doesn't ever come down, if it stays in that over tense area, over um, active, right? So maybe a five to 7.0 is, is your, now your normal resting. Now you might have a hard time doing the opposite. Or you might have a hard time opening the door for stool to come out or 
So that's constipation. Or opening the door for urine to come out, right? So that could be urgency or um, an inability to either initiate a stream, to pee, or um, you might not fully empty. If you're here and then you start to relax, you pee and then your floor goes, oh, my normal resting level needs to come back. Um, so then you might feel like you have to go all the time. So overactive bladder um, and then urge incontinence um, can come from that. Stress incontinence is what I was talking about earlier. So cough, <laughs> if you don't <laughs> relax well, right? This also could be jumping. Um, I'm always amazed whenever I talk to women that leaking while well, jumping on a trampoline or a jump, jumping rope is not normal just because you had children. Women just are completely surprised by that. They really think that, I don't know, it's a penance that you're not going to be allowed to jump ever again because you leak. So that's why that's so important. Is not, it's not just about kegeling. It is way more about that coordination. So when we do an assessment of the pelvic floor, so we do vaginally for women and then rectally for men, so if you are laying on your back, we'll do a finger vaginally or rectally, and we can assess all of these muscles, and we can act, ask you to contract and then let go, and we can feel right versus left. So that's why your hips and your back can all be part of this. Chronic back pain can create chronic tension, right, guarding. The body's in pain. So whatever is connected to these bones, like I mentioned at the beginning, anything that's connected to these bones, your back, your belly, your hips, and then even what's below, right? Your feet and your knees, and then obviously what's up above, can create pain and tension and dysfunction below. So that is why it is so important that you understand what the heck your pelvic floor is, because it really does affect your quality of life and often, I say it's like it's your deep intrinsic core, so the inside of your baseball. If everything on the outside or as things on the outside start to weaken, right, we all know that in women it tends to be our hips can get weaker, you know, our glute maxes. Um, and then in men and women, we can have um, bellies as we lose and gain weight. Um, it's not just babies that we can blame the weight on, right? Um, all of that over time can create dysfunction. So um, it's why it's so important to understand that these muscles, posture, they uh, affect your posture, they support your organs, they sphincter off and open up for bowel and bladder. We didn't talk a whole lot about sexual function, but these muscles on the outside are very much about um, sexual function, so that's the fourth function. Um, so blood flow through this area is really important. So if there's tension and reasons for the deep intrinsic core to have to work harder because your external core is weaker, even if that's not the case anymore, you were pregnant, you learned how to waddle and, and walk funky, and then you had baby, and maybe you didn't get your body back in shape, a lot of us don't. The average... Um, times that a baby is seen in their first year of life is six to eight, and we're seen once. So if you don't get your body back in shape, it can affect those habits I was talking about. So now you might be waddling when I see you 30 years later. All the different ways that our body learns to protect itself from different things, even though they're not there anymore, they are uh, like your reason to guard. So you might not have pain anymore. You're not, you don't have that baby in there anymore. But your body has learn, still learned that the best way to function, to walk, is to use these, these muscles. So now we could be overusing some muscles and underusing other muscles. The overuse um, often can fall to that your deep intrinsic core, which is your pelvic floor, your low belly, and your low back. So we'll be talking more... Um, in the future about how your pelvic floor therefore is not an island and just kegeling is not going to get you the results that you're looking for. Often the low belly, the transverse abdominis, they are supposed to work together. So often the transverse abdominis is more of a culprit and we need to look at him. And we all know that it's the elusive muscle. It's a hard one, your low abdomen to strengthen. 
So let's just, for closing today, let's play with what a Kegel feels like. So sitting, if you are, if you're not, sit down. So find your little butt bones, okay? So I'm gonna sit like this, find your little butt bones, and then put, your, put a hand on your low belly, and then just have an awareness of that space in between your butt bones. So ultimately what we're talking about is this muscle that, that, that connects to your butt bones. It's called the perineum, okay? So you're gonna feel it rise up. So come up and then come down. So we're sitting right now. Go ahead and try to kegel. So squeeze off of a fart or like you're gonna hold in urine. So squeeze, feel it lift up and then bring it back down. Hand on your low belly now. Just come back down that space in between your butt bones. And then breathe, take a breath in, take a breath out. See if you can feel that space between your butt bones. When you breathe in, it should open. And when you exhale, it should slightly come back. You might feel it, you might not, but bringing awareness there is, is what it's all about. So now, inhale, exhale. Now, go ahead and just kegel. So squeeze like you're holding in gas, and then let it go. So what did you feel in your hand? If you felt your lower hand on your belly, if you felt your hand push out, then you're holding your breath. And that's kind of the opposite of what we're looking for. What you should feel is when you kegel that your low belly pulls in slightly. It should go in, not push out. You might not feel it to anything and, and that's better than it being pushed out. But that is indicative of we wanna work on the coordination because really your low belly is the last stop shop. It should help the organs, all that rolling around, should help control them so that your floor doesn't have to do all of the work all of the time. So low belly is important. So now let's try, inhale, feel your belly go out. Exhale and kegel, feel it pull up. Inhale, let it go. Exhale, relax. So let's try that one more time. Inhale, belly goes out. Blow out while you lift up. Inhale, let it go. Feel it drop back down between those butt bones and relax. So ultimately that's what we're talking about um, as far as re-educating your nerves and your muscles, how to coordinate like they were meant to. And then of course, we address all the other issues that why, right? The why, we wanna understand the cause. What caused your pelvic floor muscles and your core as a group what caused the dysfunction? It could, and it, it's often a myriad of things. Um, it could be the fibromyalgia, um, the total hip, and the two episiotomies. It could be, um, you know, depression, anxiety, low back pain, and then prostate surgery. So the mind and the body are certainly part of this. We talked about uh, anxiety in the pelvic floor last week. And so what I was talking about before, if you have tension above, constant tension above, the floor is gonna to learn to tighten. So if you feel the next time that you have anxiety or stress, where do you feel it? And often you feel it in your upper as pressure. The floor will always respond to pressure. It should, if not, then you have symptoms. And if you do, stop ignoring them. I'm so glad that you listened to this. This is the best place to start is learn what your normal is, what, what a normal um, body should be doing, and then figure out what your normal is by, you know, just spending some time, taking a couple slow deep breaths, checking in. And then you know, are you peeing every two to four hours? If you are, then it, you're not, you didn't even think about it. You're just peeing. But if you start thinking about the bathroom and your peeing habits, that's not normal. You don't do something about it now it'll just kind of keep building and then creating other problems so awesome job giving yourself some time to learn there are many ways to stay motivated we have a website motivatetherapy.com like i said earlier we have a, a bunch of uh, exercises and self-care tips and tricks on there as well as a link to our youtube 
subscribe, share, share this video if you find it helpful. Understand that you are absolutely not alone, but we don't talk about it. So if you start talking about it, then other people will um, start talking about it and then self-caring. Facebook, obviously, and Instagram, we are always posting as well. And um, we do offer in-clinic and virtual free consultations, free 15-minute consultations with a licensed therapist. If you just want to understand more about what your body is doing and how pelvic th floor therapy and um, a whole body health approach can help you. We do also treat um, pain of joints too, so back pain, hip pain, all of those kinds of things because we understand, we have a, that really unique understanding of how movement and alignment and the body mechanics and kinesiology affects your core. So our phone number is 815-637-1100 if you just wanna call and set up an appointment. A um, actual therapy appointment would consist of getting a doctor referral. Insurance does cover it as long as we um, go through the requirements of your insurance company, which we do offer free verification, insurance verification um, as well. And that can be done in clinic or uh, virtually as well. So thank you again so much for giving yourself this time. Go in self-care. Start your week off right by just bringing some awareness to your habits and how you're feeling. Thanks again. Have a wonderful day.